I, I want to tell you about my cousin. My cousin in Indiana is a, is a bartender, and she came home several weeks ago from work. She had been there all day and uh, just was kind of fatigued, maybe a little more than usual. So she sat down and just kind of took a load off a little bit. And her roommate said, your feet seem to be really swollen. And she's like, oh, I've just been on my feet all day. And she said, no, it seems like... Uh, uh, unusually swollen and so they kind of had a back and forth for a few minutes and thought well maybe it'll go down in a second but it didn't and so they they kind of went so she finally started pushing you need to go to the er you need to go get this checked out this is not normal this is not usual finally talked her into it she went to the er and after when they started investigating her and examining her quickly they went from just kind of the casual whatever to you could tell on the face of the the medical professionals, there's something really serious going on. She was rushed back to her room. Doctor came in almost immediately, began to examine her. Next thing you know, she's being lifelined to Indianapolis, the main hospital there in Indiana, Methodist Hospital. Uh, And once she arrived there, the doctors were already there to receive her, a team of doctors. She's 30 years old. Rushed her back into the back, began to examine her, and came out and said, you have a severe virus in your heart, and your heart is actually in failure. She had no medical problems up to this point at all. That's what was causing the circulation issues and all of that. They said, we don't know for sure what the next days hold. We know for sure you'll have to have a, a, a new heart. You'll have to have a, an actual replacement heart. You may have to have an LVAD, one of the things like Dick Cheney had, to kind of keep your heart going until we get that heart in you. But clearly you're going to have a new heart. Now, to give you the, the update since then, I think through God's intervention, she's not had to have an LVAD. She's not even may not have to have a transplant. She's doing much, much better. Uh, thanks to God for that. But let me ask you a question. What would you do if you, if you went through that experience where you went from everything's going fine to all of a sudden you have this major heart issue out of nowhere? It would kind of get your whole world thrown upside down just a little bit. And if you were diagnosed with a physical heart problem, you'd have a couple options. If it was kind of a minor issue, fairly manageable condition, they would probably say you don't need surgery. They would probably just put you on the bird seed and tree bark diet. Some of you have been on that for a while where you can't eat anything fatty, can't eat anything salty or tasty or fun or anything good at all. All that goes away. And you have to start exercising. And if you do those things, your heart would probably be in good enough shape to keep going. But if your heart was declared as something critical or unrepairable, they would say you'd have to have a transplant. You'd have to have a whole new heart. Uh, Spiritually speaking... I would suggest to you that religion is the bird seed and tree bark diet. Religion says that our heart's a little bit off, not quite what God had in mind. So you need to kind of cut out the fun stuff, cut out the spiritual fatty foods, the spiritual salty foods, the spiritual, all that stuff. Cut out, you know, God says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And then you need to go to church and give some money and all of that, kind of do some exercise, cut out the bad stuff, add some good stuff, and you'll be good to go. And where that sounds good, even if it has some benefit to yourself spiritually, Uh, It just doesn't at all adequately address the symptoms. The gospel says we need a complete transplant, that our heart is damaged beyond repair. It's not what God had in mind, and we need something completely new. In the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel's prophesying ahead to the time of Jesus coming back when he would call all the people from the, the different nations, and he would bring them back, and they'd be his people, and God would be their God, and he'd wipe their sins away. And in the middle of all that, chapter 36, there's an amazing verse in verse 26 where God says, I will give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. God says, because of what Jesus has done, I'll be able to take away this, this hardened, calloused, hard, stone-like heart, and I'll be able to put a new heart in you, like I designed you to have from the beginning. God says that we need a complete transplant, a complete new life, a new start, a new opportunity, and he offers us that through Jesus. Scripture identifies our heart issues as anything but minor and manageable. It doesn't describe it that way at all. In Jeremiah chapter 17, the message translation says, the heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful, a puzzle that no one can figure out. But I, God, search the heart and examine the mind. I go to the heart of the human. I get to the root of things. I treat them as they really are, not as they pretend to be. All of the pretentiousness in our society that puts on game faces and doesn't let people into what's really going on in our life, it hides the sin and the selfishness and the greed and the the darkness that's there. But underneath all of that, God says, when you strip that back away, us and our just unchanged selves, it's a pretty dark place. It's real popular today to say, you know, follow your heart or what's your heart telling you to do or just go with where your heart leads. But the Bible says that doesn't lead to good places at all. It leads to some really dark 
uh, difficult decisions. You know, if I could confess to you, come on a more personal note, I'm, I'm sometimes shocked at the level of, of hypocrisy in my own life. I mean, I believe the words of the Bible. I believe them to be true. I, I teach them to be true. I want to follow them, and yet I'll find myself hearing this ugly word come out of my mouth in anger. Or I'll hear myself uh, thinking these thoughts that are darker than what I would agree with. Or I'll find myself doing things that I would not endorse. And I realize that I am irreparably broken. That what God intended for me to be is not who I am. And maybe, just maybe, you're in that same spot as well. The Bible indicates we are. Romans chapter 3 says, As the scriptures say, there is no one who always does what is right. Not even one. You know, we pretend and we hide and we, we act like maybe someone else has got it together. We just don't have the right things, but no one gets it right all of the time. Isaiah chapter 64 says, we're all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. When we compare ourselves to God, even the good accomplishments, the things we do to try to win his favor, when we compare them to God, they're just like filthy throwaway rags not worthy of anything in God's sight, not worthy of any of his notice. Our lives don't call for a tweak or a little better diet. Our lives call for a complete transplant. And it causes us to hold on to something more than just what we can grab on otherwise. I was taking the, my twins to school earlier this week, and that means they're late because anytime they're on time, they want to ride the bus. So if, they, if they're getting late to school, then I'll drive them to school. It saves a few minutes. And we live right across the duplex. We live in Chapman's Crossing. They're at Chapman's Retreat Elementary. So if you're going to leave Chapman's Crossing in the mornings with all the other traffic going on, there's a little bit of a hold your breath, get your life in your hands, and do this little across the street thing because people are turning and the roads don't line up right and people are coming that other direction. And most people who are coming at that time are late for school, so they're all kind of tense and in a bad mood. And so we pulled out that particular day, and there was a break in the cars, and so I did a little right and a back left, kind of an S-turn, and my, my twins are in the front seat are kind of flying all over the place, and Erica reaches up with her casted hand and grabs a hold of the little, you know, suicide handle there on the one side, and Kara's in the middle, and in the middle, there, uh, in my uh, rearview mirror, I've got a, a yarn that hangs with a cross hanging on, so she grabs up and hold of the cross, and, and Erica says, I'm holding on to the handle. And Kara, in her best Pentecostal preacher voice, says, I'm holding on to the cross of Jesus, she says. And she's, she's laughing. She's going around. And here we go through the S-curve, and we're on to the school. You know, life would say to us that it calls for more than just holding on to little prop things that would hold us up. We can't just tweak this through. Our lives are irreparably not what God had in mind. They call for a complete transplant. Second Corinthians chapter 5 says, This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And when you and I come to Christ, and I want to invite you over these next several weeks, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never asked him to, to lead you, if you've never asked him to forgive you, if you've never yielded yourself to him, you know, if you've never uh, pledged your life to him, if you've never been baptized, whatever it is you've not done, I want to invite you and challenge you to give yourself to Jesus this, these next several weeks. Because the Bible says when you do that, when I do, have done that, then God comes and begins to live inside of me and we get a whole new heart, a whole new life. And God saw our, our, our life, he saw our need, and he sent Jesus to live for us, not just to give us an example and good teaching, although he did that, he came to die for us so that just as someone who needs a new heart, gets that heart at the expense of someone else's loss, we get this new life at the expense of Jesus' life. You know, when you talk to somebody who's been through a, a transplant situation, almost always one of the, the biggest difficulties they face beyond the physical things, which are challenging, is the emotional piece that says, this heart is in me because someone else died. And my family is rejoicing because some other family is mourning. And there's something emotional that goes on right there that would be really difficult to, to live with. And it's so much like the gospel. It says that we get a chance at a new life, a new start, a fresh heart, because Jesus came and give, gave us his. And then he rose from the dead so that just like he rose from the dead, we can have a new life as well. And God invites us into that story. He invites us into this new life. Not just to tweak your life, but a fresh new start. And I want to invite you to be a part of that these next several weeks. That's what this series is all about. We're calling it Transplant because we're talking about what happens not only when you identify the need for a new heart, but when you get that new heart, that new life, what implications does that have in your life? How does that change the way you live and the way that I live? 
I want us to challenge us to live differently. The theme verse I'm going to use this whole, this whole next several weeks is out of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, verse 6 says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flames the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. So Paul, the apostle who wrote this, was writing to his uh, man he was mentoring, Timothy. And he said, I was there when you gave your life to Christ. I laid my hands on you and prayed that God's spirit would come into you, and it did. And I wanted you to fan that into flames. Allow that, that work of God to f- work all the way out and, and have its full effect on your life. I saw that. I was there for that. And then here's the key verse in verse 7. It says, for the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but instead it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. If you've got the spirit of God living in you, if you've given your life to Christ, then your, your life doesn't have the spirit of timidity or fear or worry in you, but you've got a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline. And we'll talk about that over these next several weeks. Timidity and fear, according to this verse, are something that can be given. It's not who you were designed to be. You were not designed to be fearful and timid. But that spirit can come on you, can take root in your life and control you. I mean, if you look at the Garden of Eden before sin was in the world, I think there's a lot of things you can compare and contrast to today and learn a lot from that. One of the things you'll notice about that, that period of time was there was no fear. If you ever thought of that or not, there was no fear in the garden. Adam and Eve walked literally with God. You never see in Scripture someone walking with God or even seeing God without being terrified, but they walked with God and were spending time with Him without any fear. They didn't have fear of other animals. They didn't have fear of other people coming into attack or something being broken into. They weren't worried about not having enough. They had all the trees and plants for food. They could just eat whenever they wanted to. They had absolutely no fear. I mean, they even walked around without clothes on. Now, think how fearful that would be to go through Spring Hill without any clothes. They weren't afraid of anything. They are completely without fear. And that's how God created us to be. In the garden, fear was absent. They trusted God to provide for them. They trusted God to protect them. Even the animals seemed to trust one another. You know, when the snake came in and began to talk to them, their reaction wasn't fear. It would have been what my reaction would have been. Their reaction was just, it's just kind of a, let's have this conversation with a snake. It's very, very bizarre. I saw this uh, out of the Jesus Storybook Bible, a great description of what happened when sin entered into the world in this scene from the garden. That she writes, a dove flew from Adam's hand. A deer darted in the thicket. It was as if they were frightened by something. A chill was now in the air. Something strange was happening. This fear entered the world. Along with sin, along with ourselves, fear entered the world. And we began to be a, a fearful, worrisome bunch. Today, thousands of years later, we live consumed with worry and fear. I mean, how often do you turn on the TV and have an advertisement put before you by some insurance company or something saying, you better have our coverage because something bad's getting ready to happen and you need protected from that. I mean, so, it's like every other commercial seems like today. I, I looked it up because I was curious. And in the last year, we have spent over $6 billion in our country on insurance advertising through TV to tell you you need more and better insurance. We're a fearful bunch. We're a worrisome, anxious bunch. More money is spent on anxiety medications and and help with fear and worry than ever before in any other culture. We're consumed by that. And yet it was not how we were designed to be. And not only was it fear and timidity and anxiety and worry not what we were designed to be, it's not what God's calling us to be going forward. The Bible says that when Jesus lives in you, God's spirit does not bring timidity, does not bring fear. It's not from God. God doesn't want you to live that way. Think back to the Garden of Eden. They trusted God to be their provider, that they would always have enough, and they trusted God to be their protector, that they would always be cared for and safe and loved. And he calls us to live with God just as they did before sin entered the world. I noticed a few years ago, and I shared with some of you, how you look at the the commands in Scripture about worry, you see Jesus eight different times giving his command about worry and anxiety. And it's interesting, the, the, the connection. The first command Jesus gives us, he says, do not worry. And then the second command later on in the Gospels he gives us is do not worry. And then he says, do not worry. And then he says, do not worry, do not worry. The sixth one was do not worry, do not worry. And lastly, to make sure we get it, he says, don't worry. I mean, the overwhelming sense of what God wants you to do with anxiety and worry and fear is don't. There's no place for it. Worry and fear and anxiety should be expunged from your 
dictionary. It's not part of who you are in Christ. Look what Paul says in Romans. This is a great kind of a background for understanding this. He says, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who then can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? If God is willing to send his son to die for you and send his son to die for me, how is he not going to protect us? If God is willing to send his son to die for you and to die for me, how is he not going to provide for you? If he's willing to do that, he's willing to give us all things. God is our provider and God is our protector. First of all, I want you to think about how God protects us. The Bible says that God looks out over us, he watches over us, and he protects us. If you read through Scripture, you see examples of God uh, directing armies and directing nations and directing kings to help things go the way that he intends for them to go. And God is our protector. First John chapter 4 says, This is how we know that we live in him and that he lives in us. He has given us of his spirit, and so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. There is now no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. I want you to think about what you and I believe, because I don't think we live this out very well. What I believe, and, and don't necessarily just follow, I believe that Jesus came and lived and died, and when he rose again from the, from the dead, that he had all authority in heaven and on earth. He said right before he left to go to heaven, he said, all authority has now been given to me in heaven and on earth. So, so now Jesus has authority over, over people. He has authority over kings. He has authority over nations. He has authority over um, the weather and the environment. He has authority over this earth. He has authority over everything in life, heaven and on earth. And this same Jesus loved me so much to die for me so that I wouldn't, I wouldn't face harm, so I wouldn't face uh, death without him. But now I worry that he's not going to be there for me. I worry he's not going to protect me. And all he ever told me to do with worry is not. Some of that doesn't go together. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth and he's told me not to worry, how can I in faith continue to do so? I just can't. I have to trust in God as our father to protect us. You know, have you ever had the comforting feeling when you were a kid and you were scared of, of knowing that you're, parents were down the hall, they were going to watch out for things. When you're a kid and you hear about somebody breaking in or somebody getting vandalized, I always would know. We lived in the upstairs room as a kid. I had, there's three rooms upstairs. I'd stay up there and I always thought if something bad, if somebody were bad broke in, they'd have to get through the downstairs to get to the stairway to get to me and dad's down there. It's going to be fine. I had this sense of protection that my dad was going to be there. It was going to be okay. And God, our father longs to protect you. It's going to be okay. You, when you find yourself being worried, I want you to remind yourself that God's not chewing his fingernails. God's not uh, having the trouble getting past anxiety at night. He, he's got this. God's in control. He's got it. He's big enough and he's powerful enough. Our Father protects us. Second, I want you to know that our Father provides for us. Jesus says that all you have to do is look at the birds of the air. Look at the animals around you. They're all provided for, and he cares more for you than he does for any of them. I mean, you ever think about that? This time of, this time of year, as all of the, the plants are going dormant, as all of the, uh, you know, going in from fall, now, we're going into winter soon, all of the food sources for these animals are beginning to go away, and yet we come into spring. We won't come into spring with no animals. They're all provided for. God has made arrangements. God takes care to make sure they have enough. And Jesus says, when you see the animals being provided for, the vast system that that would require to make sure they have enough, you should be reminded that God cares so much more for you than he does for them. God, your father, is your provider. I love this quote from Keith Caserta. He says, worry is the interest you pay on a debt that you may or may not even owe. And how much time do we spend? How much energy do we spend? How much effort do we spend worrying and stewing about what if this happens, what if that happens, when they may not even come true at all? God provides for you. And you can take assurance in that. If later on this afternoon my kids came to me and said, are you going to feed us tonight? I would first think they're being sarcastic. We kind of speak fluent sarcasm in the Huddleston household. I think they're being sarcastic. I'd say, ah, shut up, kid. Let's go. Yeah, I'll provide for you. But if they came back the next day genuinely concerned that I wasn't going to feed them, that would be bothersome to me. Like, have you heard something? Have you read something? If they came back the next day and the next day and the next day, at some point it would begin to be offensive to me. 
Why don't you think I'm going to provide for you? I've provided for you every day of your life. Why don't you think I'll provide for you now? I'm your father. I love you. And when we worry that we're not going to be provided for, we take all of that pressure and ownership on us as if God is somehow going to abandon us, I think it has to be bothersome to him, which is why he tells us again and again and again not to worry. Luke chapter 12, verse 25 says, Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? We have such a little amount of control, and yet we worry as if somehow we can change the dynamics of so many things. And God has said he'll provide for you. He'll take care of you. So don't worry. I think the third thing I want you to notice is not only that God provides for us and God protects us, but then God wants us to guard our heart that he's given us new. He's given us a new heart, a new life, and he wants us to guard that. Proverbs 4 says, above all else, above everything else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. You know, if I were to receive a new heart, if I needed a transplant, if I had some virus, something that attacked my heart, and I needed a new heart, wouldn't it be true that I would have a real difficult time going to McDonald's ever again? You know, you could just never go to Captain D's ever again. It's like somebody gave me a new heart. I can't gunk it up like I did the last one. I've got to somehow keep it, somehow keep it new. And the Bible says that God has paid so dearly for you to have a fresh start, a new life. And he wants us to guard that heart because everything in your life goes through that. Proverbs chapter 12 says, anxiety weighs down the heart. And when I allow myself to be fearful and anxious and worried, it weighs down my heart that Jesus gave me a fresh start with, that Jesus paid so dearly for. You know, all this analogy about transplants, it made me curious. And so I wanted to see how long we've been doing human transplants. Dr. Christian Bernard recorded the first human-to-human heart transplant in December of 1967. It's not all that long ago, really. It's been fairly, fairly recent. Uh, Dr. Bernard had performed uh, heart transplants on 50 dogs prior to that, over 50 dogs, getting ready for whenever he would have the moment if somebody would allow him the opportunity to try that. So he'd been preparing and preparing and preparing for that day. And that day in December of 1967, he was able to do it. The man who received the heart was in poor health. He had diabetes. He had uh, a heart condition that wasn't, was fatal. He wasn't in good health. He was in his mid-50s. And they asked him later, they said, was it hard to talk him into being the first recipient of the new heart? And he said, no, he had no other options. It's not hard at all. In fact, he he later wrote, says, for a dying man, it's not difficult because he knows he's at his end. If a lion were to chase you to the bank of a river filled with crocodiles, you'll leap into the water, convince you of a chance to swim at least to the other side. That's the nature of the gospel, really, that, that we understand that there's no way we can get to God on our own. We can, there's no way we can be good enough or do enough right things or stop doing enough wrong things that we could somehow get to God on our own accord. The only chance we have is Jesus. He's the only way possible that, that maybe what he said is true. Maybe he would forgive me too. So forgive ourselves to God freely. It's not difficult to talk someone in at that point. Denise Darville, the first heart donor, in fact, it was a very different case altogether, where the recipient was a 50-plus-year-old man in very poor health. At the end of his life, Miss Darva was a 25-year-old young woman in great health. She'd gone out that morning with her mother. They were in South Africa, and they'd gone shopping. They'd gone to several different stores and shops all around, had a wonderful little day. And her mother said, let's go for a spot of tea. This South Africa, after all. Let's go for a spot of tea. So they went, went to uh, this little, toward this little diner, and on their way, as they were going through an intersection, a drunken driver came through, didn't see them at all, plowed into their car at full speed. Her mother was killed instantly, and Miss Darville suffered such a brain trauma, a head trauma, skull fracture, that even though her body was in, still in pretty good shape, she found herself lying in this bed in South Africa, completely brain dead. So they called her dad had him come in, and Mr. Bernard had the unenviable task of saying to him, "Um, your wife is dead, and your daughter lies here completely brain dead, even though her heart is still existing fine, her organs are still doing fine, and you now have the decision of allowing us to, to harvest her organs so that other people can live, but knowing that it will actually kill her. Can you imagine being the dad in that spot? 
He'd probably gone to work that morning or done whatever he was going to do, kissed his wife goodbye, saw his daughter leave with her together, and must have watched them drive away, having no idea what his day would hold. And then just a few short hours later, finds out that his wife is, is gone and his daughter is gone too, but now he has to make the decision of allowing her to leave. After some consideration, uh, Mr. Darville allowed permission to be given, and he granted access, and they went in and harvested her heart, and it went to this... this um, middle-aged man, and then her, in, a, in a great story of South Africa, in history, if you know the history of South Africa, her, her kidneys went to, uh, it was a scandalous event because she was a white woman, and her kidneys went to a, a young black man who needed them, and it was so scandalous in that day that they allowed that to happen. But her, several lives were saved because of this father's very difficult choice. It's really a lot like the gospel, that, that God had the opportunity to allow us to live by causing his son to die, allowing his son to die. And so Jesus, the, the, God's only son, went to the cross and died so that you and I could have a new heart, a new life, a new opportunity. But actually it's a step more than that. In Mr. Darville's case, in Mr. Darville's case, there was absolutely no options afforded him that would get his daughter to walk out of the hospital. If he'd have said no, she wasn't coming home with him. If he'd have said absolutely not, she wasn't going to get better. She was gone. It was just clinical at this point. But I believe that God in heaven looked down at our sin-soaked world, all of our hearts corrupted and hardened as they were, and Jesus sitting at his right hand, they chose to send him to earth, to send him to die for us. Can you imagine hearing of someone who's in a heart needed a new heart and you choosing to offer up your child to give them that heart I, I can't even can't even fathom can you fathom that choice in Mr. Darvel's case let alone in a healthy case and yet God loved you and me so much that he gave up his son Jesus to die for us you know whether you're a believer or not you've heard that that nugget of truth so often that it, it probably has lost some of its shock value but God sent his only son to die for you and die for me so that you can have a fresh start, a transplant, a new heart, a new life. And now he's given us that new chance to live out a whole different way.